here. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 19, it says this. Then I explained to the nobles and the officers, uh, uh, or excuse me, the officials of all the people. The work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to whatever is sounding. When our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with the guard duty at night and work during the day. And during this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor my guards uh, who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us all of the time, even when we went for water. Now, I think it's interesting that when they are uh, figuring out what's all up, they keep working on the wall, right? They're just like, okay, we got to stay focused. No matter what attacks could come, no matter what threats are out there, no matter what the criticisms, we got to stay focused. And Nehemiah doesn't allow the need for protection to get in the way of building the wall. It just becomes another thing that he's got to do in order to complete the job. They don't let their fears or these threats of war distract them. They stay focused. So they work with half of the men on guard duty and the other half actually working. And they have one hand with a sword in it and one hand with a hammer in it. And if the alarm sounded at one part of the city, everyone would come running to defend the wall, to defend the city, to defend each other. Which leads to the biblical truth I want us to wrestle with tonight. As you're working to fulfill God's purposes in your life, as you are working towards building a better world, you will not only have to build it, but you'll also have to defend it. See, if Satan can't distract you, he will bring distractions to infiltrate the work. Another crazy thing no one ever told me before I entered ministry is how many attacks were going to come against the culture we were trying to build. I discovered quickly that you not only have to fight, but fight often for the culture of a community. As we set out to start Waypoints, we knew that we did not want a Sunday morning service. We didn't actually want Christians to come to church. And I know that sounds really funny, but there is this toxicity uh, that comes with Christianity. And, and there's this toxicity that comes with people who love to church hop. They just bounce from one church to another, they stay long enough to criticize, but not long enough to change. And so Tuesday and Friday nights kept some of that toxicity out, but it just kept trying to creep its way in. And fighting for the community, fighting for what God wants, takes this constant diligence and a willingness to fight for it. And there have been so many people over the years who have come in with their own agendas and tried to change uh, what God wants us to do and become. And I can spend the rest of the evening telling you story after story, but I just want to tell you one as an example for tonight. I was asked by a couple who had been a part of our community for you know six, eight months. Uh, they were asked, or they asked me if I could sit down and have a meeting with them. And I said, sure. And so we scheduled a time and they came right in and they sat down and I could just tell that they were nervous and they had something to talk about. And they had this manila envelope with papers in it. And after we greeted one another and we sat down and I prayed, uh, we started to talk. And finally, they said, well, we wanted to know if you knew what kind of people you had in your church. I said, yes, I'm fully aware of what kind of people were in our community. And they said, well, did you know? And as they said that statement, they opened up the folder and picked out a piece of paper that had a picture of one of our people on it. And I could tell, because I've seen these before, it was a criminal record. And they had gone and they had looked up and actually paid for this person's criminal record. And I stopped them. I reached uh, over and I closed their folder and I said, oh yes, I know. Then they went on to the next piece of paper and said, well, did you know and I saw yet another person's picture and another person's criminal record, and I closed it very quickly. Uh, and I said, yes, I know. Then they went on to the next one, and they said, well, yes, I know. And I finally, I just stopped them. I said, you could go through your whole envelope, but yes, I know who is here. I know what they've done, and I don't care. They are children of God who Jesus has forgiven, and I will not hold their past against them. 
they are not those people anymore. And it was obviously not what they wanted. They obviously wanted me to kick these people out of leadership positions or maybe even out of the church. So I finally said, after much argument and back and forth conversation, I finally said this. I said, I'll make you a deal. I will hold their past against them as long as I can hold your past against you. Needless to say, they don't come here anymore. And I lovingly encourage them that this probably isn't the right place for them. Now, some of you might be thinking, that's mean. <laughs> but in fact, it's protecting everyone who is here. We can't have that kind of Christianity here. It will destroy the grace of the gospel that's happening in this place. See, not everyone is going to like and not everyone will agree that, uh, with what God has called you to do in your life. That's just a part of the deal. And as you embrace your identity in Christ and as you use your gifts and as you walk out the mission God has given you, you're going to have opposition. And we've talked about this. But the opposition isn't just at the beginning. It is also something that you have to deal with all of the time. You're going to have to have a hammer in one hand building a better future, and you're going to have to have a sword in the other hand. You're not looking for a fight. You're just ready to defend what is right. You're not defending your religion. You're not defending your politics. Those are distractions. You are defending the work of the Holy Spirit moving in people's lives. You want to create a culture where people are valued, where life change is happening, where love is the most powerful force. What are the things that are the most precious and valuable to God? Those are the things that we must defend. And, must, and may I say, at the top of that list is human beings. Simply look at the life of Jesus. Jesus is constantly defending the most vulnerable in his society, in our society. The broken, the homeless, the immigrant, the hurting, the shunned, those living on the fringe of whatever society and religion has dictated the truth is, is that you cannot build something for God and with God that also won't need to be protected. We can't build a better world without saying yes to some things and saying no to other things. We can't build a better world without defending people. Where grace abounds, religion will try to fight its way in. Where love is given, hate will stand in opposition. Where justice exists, revenge and retaliation will invade. Where equality is lived out, prejudice will try to march in. Where hope is alive, doubt will try to kill it. Where trust is given, fear will try to take it away. My friends, we are desperately in need of a better world. And that comes by us building it 